Hello and welcome to another episode of Don't Shit on the Bus. I'm your host, Adam Omakais, tuning in all the way from Los Angeles, California, for episode number 67 with my good friend, Bing. Well, his name's Ryan Bingham, but he goes by Bing, so it feels weird calling him anything other than that. Today we kind of have, uh, let's call it an origin story. Got to talk to Bing about how he became a manager, which I think is a route that is very viable and realistic for some people getting into the music industry. You know, some people want to tour, some people want to be in a band. And managing is, I mean, if you listen to the Mike Mowry episode, you know what managing is. It is very much the person that holds everything together for a band that kind of, you know, delegate who does what when they do it and oversee everything that happens with that artist project. I thought it was cool, however, to hear how Bing started at a day job, then interning, then working at a management company and eventually working his way up to a manager. I mean, that is a very organic, natural progression that I think a lot of people could see themselves taking. And it's nice to hear from a manager what that path looks like. I've known Bing for a long time. I didn't always know him as a manager. He showed up on a tour once when I was with the band and was like, hey, I'm here. I'm doing VIP. We were like, cool. And I hope Bing laughs during this interview. I know he laughs. He's got one of the best laughs ever. He's just a good vibe. And he's always just kind of made every place he existed a place he should be existing. I don't know how to explain that, but you never feel like Bing's out of place. He's just there. You're like, oh, yeah, let's go. This guy's here. He's hanging now. That's cool. And I like that about him. I think it's a cool, I think it's a cool personality trait. I wish my, I think my personality is kind of the opposite to like, why is that guy here? Who is he? What is going on? But with that being said, before we get to the episode, of course, thank you to our patrons for their weekly contributions to making the episode possible. I appreciate it. And let's all welcome our new patron, Caleb. Thank you so much for signing up. Thanks for joining. Thanks for contributing on a weekly basis. We appreciate it dearly. I hope you enjoy episode 67 of Don't Shit on the Bus. Take it away, Bing. I'll see you next week. Hey, Bing. How's it going, man? Very well, sir. How are you? Good. I am excited to have you on the podcast today. And, you know, for those of you who aren't watching on video, Bing is in a bed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very comfy. (laughs) Welcome to LA. And, you know, before you got on, Connor was making like, the the Zencaster recording. He's like, is his real name Bing? And it, your name is Bing, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, so it's p- the first part of my last name. My my name is Ryan Bingham. Okay. There we go. When I was in the fourth grade, uh, there were four other Ryans, five total, <laughs> in my fourth grade class. So every the teacher just called us by our last names, and that just never stopped. And then I got older, and it just got easier to shorten it to Bing, other than Bingham. Because it was just easier to say in conversations when I was like introducing myself to people, and it just stuck. Yeah, and it, I think that name fits you. I don't know how to, how to put that into words, but you really the name embodies you, or you embody the name. It's both, or one or the other. I don't know, but it works. So it's, it's definitely become. It's weird when people call me by my first name. Like someone accidentally did it the other day, and I was like, "What? Who are you talking to?" <laughs> very it's very odd sometimes do you even know me yeah sometimes i'll be out because like my mom or like my nana called me by my first and my sister and stuff like yeah. that but like no one else in my life so i'll like hear it sometimes and be like well, <laughs> what who's here i love that yeah we had like other people on here named moose or something and connor's like is this oh, like yeah, moose? moose is it just like it's like a made-up name i was like no it's his name but it's his last yeah. name I mean, that's one thing that's great about touring people that you know just as well as I do is some of them have real great nicknames. Oh, yeah. Cowboy, Bagel, French Fry. Wow, you just ripped him. I, I knew a dude named Delicious one time. I remember Delicious. Gr- is he from great Chicago? Merch, dude. He, yeah, he's a great dude. Yeah, like, yeah. Just, some, just wild nicknames. I have a friend in, his name's Jeremy Burke, and I won't say his tour name on here because it embarrasses him, but... um. I was so used to calling him his tour name that when he switched careers into booking comedy shows in LA, I would show up and call him his name. He's like, Adam, you can't call me that anymore. <laughs> I was like, I'm sorry. It just sticks in my, it'd be like, if you wanted me to start calling you Ryan, I'd be like, no. Yeah. It would Bad. be very odd. <laughs> oh man. I do like though, the kind of idea when, I don't know about you, but when I see these people that I used to tour with, they usually still let me call them their tour name. And it's kind of like, it's not an inside joke, 
but it's nice to be have like this like callback in like a cool guy club kind of yeah you have a secret unspoken little thing that you can share yeah oh man well cool well i'm so happy to have you on the podcast today i will do an intro before this goes so we don't need to really explain too much on who you are in that regard but you know I like to start with how I know the guest, and I usually go back to my most, my farthest back memory, and I actually have talked about you before on the podcast. I forget who I had on, but I remember when you came, I was with a data member, and you just showed up on tour, mm-hmm. kind of. You like showed yeah. up on pre-production of tour, and mm-hmm. then I was with the band at the time, and we didn't know, but then you just stuck, you were just on the tour, and we're like, oh, I guess he's here. He's here. Now. <laughs> yeah. And it was great because you're a good vibe. But what was your journey before I met you then? I think that was like 2013, right? Yeah, yeah. That was the house party tour in 2013. Okay. Um, Be- before that point in your career, you obviously did other things to get there. What What was your... So much. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I started touring in high school when I was 15, just with like local bands and stuff. Uh, I have a, a single mom who's just like really cool. <laughs> Yeah, that sounds amazing. Who just like let me go. And I started touring with like clothing companies. My first tour was Warp Tour in 2004. And I worked for Holy a shit. clothing company just selling, you know, the style of shirts that were popular back then. Like a blue shirt with like a huge yellow bird and like cartoons. So it was, just, it was, it was cool. It was called Naive Clothing. They're not around anymore. But uh, that's how I started. Um, And I actually wanted to, I thought I was going to be the next Kevin Smith. Like I wanted to (laughs) make like indie movies and stuff like that. I like, I went to specialty TV production classes in high school and stuff like that. Like touring was just something I kind of did for fun because I liked music. Um, Like, you know, in breaks at school and stuff like that. That's awesome. I can't believe you're on Warped Tour at 15. Yeah, it was pretty weird. (laughs) I never knew that about you. That's amazing. Well done, dude. Yeah, it was it was pretty wild. And then I just sort of transitioned into working with bands because I was basically like an assistant or an intern to this dude who was local in Orlando, Florida, where I'm from, who was like helping me. I like worked for his like production company, but he also worked for like a local label that signed a bunch of bands and stuff like that who were going out on tour. And they were sending me out to do like early days like youtube video blogs so i would like film all day and edit all night uh, to like put up these like warp tour video blogs like on tour and stuff but because i had toured before and sold merch with the clothing company i was like i can also do that for you if you want oh nice like i know how to do that and then it just stuck wait how old were you then were you like were you 16 or like you know what i mean was this uh when i yeah yeah or yeah, 16, 17. At 18, Damn. I moved to New York and I went to film school. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, I hated it. <laughs> uh, I <like> quickly <laughs> realized how uh, the school that I went to just was letting people in who could afford the tuition. And they okay. didn't really care about like fostering talent or like helping people succeed. They just wanted to get your tuition. So I was only there for like a year and then I quit. Um, right around like May of 2008. And then I just didn't know what else to do. I'd moved back to Florida. So I just hopped on Warp Tour again. And then it just kind (laughs) of never stopped. Who are you on Warp Tour with when you hop back on? Uh, that right. in 2008, I was with a pop band called Between the Trees. Oh yeah. I remember Between the Trees. Yeah. That's awesome. They did pretty good. They, they signed to you know, uh, a major label and stuff like that. And they did, they were pretty successful. They didn't really go too far. They ended in like 2010, I think. Yeah. 2009. But yeah, that, that's how I got my start was, was through them. I toured with them more than almost anybody. And then it was just a series of tours and, you know, working for anybody that I could selling merch, uh, running VIP events. Once those started becoming like a thing in the touring world and stuff like that, there's a, a really awesome dude, uh, who works for Atlantic records who lived in Orlando at the time that I was friends with just by being like someone in the local scene or whatever. And so I would go over to his house and hang out and stuff like that. And I was talking to him about how I was frustrated that I wasn't able to find a gig on the road. This is like 2000, the end of 2012. And I was like really frustrated with 
not being able to find a job. And I was talking to him at his house about it. And he's like, well, I know this guy who runs a management company in Orlando. His name's Mark. Yeah. <laughs> who's <down my> block. <laughs> you should give him a call and see if they have anything. Like, even if it's not a paid gig, you could intern and at least be getting music work. You'll be working in the yeah. music industry. Like I had... You know, I worked at bars and I valeted cars at hotels and I was like a bellman at hotels and stuff like that, like my at home jobs. And I wasn't on tour. I had like pretty, a pretty good setup with some like local businesses that when I would be home, they gave me shifts. And when I was gone, they didn't. That's a dream setup. Literally a dream setup. Yeah, like couldn't have been any cooler. So really quick, I, I do want to hear more, but I wanted to ask like for people listening who maybe are looking for something similar, like a job, is is that unique to your bosses or is that unique to the kind of job you're working? Was that something that was viable at bars? Do you know what I mean? I think it's a little, I think it's a little bit of both, to be honest okay. with you. I did have really cool bosses who were like, you're going on tour with like rock and roll <laughs> bands? Like, that's amazing. So Let's like, go. they were like very hyped <laughs> about like the, like who I was going out with and stuff like that. And then at the same time, I think like gig work like that, that is uh, like kind of easy to slip in and out of that doesn't require a whole lot of like training or brain yeah. power can, I know what you mean. can very easily become those jobs for people, valets, okay. uh, waiters, well, you know, that kind of stuff where it's not like, you know, you have to like prepare a presentation or spreadsheets and like be responsible for stuff. You just have to show up. Yeah. We just need you to do the thing right. Right. Just show up, park the car, bring the <laughs> car back. That's all you have to do. Show up, bring the bags up to the hotel room, bring the empty cart down. Like those kinds of jobs lend themselves very easily to that kind of stuff. I will just say Bing sounds like a great name for somebody who does those things. And I don't know why. It just like... I had to fight so hard at some of those jobs to get them to not make my name tag be Ryan. It's so... <laughs> I was so, but some of them, I was like, that's, that's a bummer. It's memorable. Like if I went somewhere and had like somebody take my car, whose name was Bing, I would remember you after first meeting you. And next time I came, I'd be like, oh, Bing, let's fucking go. Oh, dude. Also, I mean, I, you would not have recognized me at all. I mean, I had, uh, for those who are not uh, watching the video or what have you, like I am yeah. a, I'm a pretty bald guy. It was not back then. Respect. Basically, all of the hair that is on my face for my beard was just on top of my head and my, it was literally <laughs> swapped. Because the, I worked, it was like a five diamond hotel and they like, they, I had to wear, you know, those like black sleeves that like basketball players wear to cover my tattoos. Okay. I had to keep yeah. my, there was no facial hair allowed. Like it was like real swanky. You had to like, look the part. Yeah. Which was the uncool part of it, but they paid really well when I was home. <laughs> yeah, that's great. All right. I'm sorry I interrupted you a little bit there, but I no, had no, to, please. I had to, I had to reflect on that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I actually left out a little part where I actually I actually lived in L.A. for a little bit uh, oh, in casually? the summer of 2012. Yeah, I worked at Side One Dummy Records. I saw that on your LinkedIn. Yeah, I, I worked there for a little bit as just an unpaid intern. Again, was very frustrated with not being able to find a job that summer. So I just emailed all the labels that I knew to see <laughs> all of if them? I could literally all of them. In fact, fun fact. Your previous guest, my coworker, Melissa Hemingway, worked for Fueled by Ramen at around that time. Uh, she turned me down for an internship. Wow. Shots fired. In her defense, and she would, you know, she would probably want me to <laughs> defend her. And this is like, they were only accepting some, some places, especially when it's like, she was working at Fueled by Ramen, which is like owned by a giant company and stuff like that. Yeah. They have like a lot of requirements for internships and stuff. And at the time I was not in school and that was a requirement for one of, for their internships was like, you had to be getting college credit for it and stuff. Yeah. Uh, so I went with side one because they didn't require any of that kind of stuff. But then <laughs> after, after that, at the end of the year, I was meeting with, with my friend and he told me to hit up Mark to just see if they had anything. I went in. Uh, I interviewed with men who had become my bosses, Mark and John. What, what was that interview like? Um, it was intimidating. I wore a suit, and when I got there, they were <laughs> when I got there, they were like, "You did need to wear a suit. This is not that kind of place." <laughs> I, I'm just picturing, like I know your bosses. I've worked with them, and I'm just picturing them sitting down, like, "Oh yeah, Ryan's on his way," and you show up. Like, was it like a black and white suit, or was it, yep. you know, okay? Oh, That's yeah. sick. I love oh, that. Yeah. 
They were like, when you come in next time, you don't have to wear that. <laughs> T-shirt and jeans is fun. You're like, this is all I own. <laughs> this is what I yeah. wear. Yeah. I will not intern here. Yeah. So I just became an intern and I would go there. And that was like a really crazy like scheduling time in my life. Like I don't understand looking back how I did it. Yeah. There would be multiple days a week where I would wake up at 6 a.m., go to park cars at the hotel from 7 until 9 a.m. And then I would intern at Fly South from 9 until 3. And then I ended up going back to college and finishing my degree at a private university called Rollins College in Winter Park. And so I was I took classes from 4 until 9 at night. Oh, my God. I worked at the bar from 10 until 2. I'm like, that was like Tuesdays and Thursdays, I think. <laughs> If I tried to do that now, my brain would explode. My body would explode. Exactly. Um, That's so doing wild. That. Hey, respect. <laughs> yeah. I was doing that, uh, and I got, an, I got an offer come summertime to do Warped again. So I told you know, my internship, like, hey, look, I love being here. I want to be here when I get back, but I'm going to go make money on tour mm -hmm. and, and do this. So I went out on Warped 2013. I got home from that. Who are you out with? I worked for a band called Ann Arbor. Oh, I love Ann Arbor. Dude. Yeah, they're awesome. It was right. They were releasing the, like, I forget the name of the album. It's got, like, pictures on the front of it, like, old-timey kind of pictures. He had just uh, slayed the guy in who's like, was Ann Arbor, at least at the time, uh, had just released that album. It was so good. I, I loved working with that band. Yeah, I'm looking at the They were, they were wild dudes. It was fun. Burnout? They, yes, yes. Got it. It's got so many good songs on it. That was a, a really fun summer. Um, it was like one of the only times where I kind of, I got that job through their manager who managed another one of the bands that I had worked for. It okay. was like a, a new situation for me getting thrown into working for a band that I didn't know anybody. Okay. I see what you're saying. Which would prepare me for meeting you guys. Because <laughs> as soon as I got home from that, I immediately went back to interning at Fly South. And then it was maybe like a week or two after I'd gotten back where they were talking. I just heard everyone in the office talking about how they needed a VIP person for the house party tour. And I immediately just like stuck my head in the door. I was like, I can do that. I can do that. You could, you could pay me cheap. Like, don't worry about it. Like, you know me, I'm not a creep. <laughs> like, I've yeah. been here for a while. Like, I can I exist can, on the road. That is how that happened. John and Mark were just like, okay. <laughs> you're just running the vip thing so just go you're like really i go i'm and going i i absolutely remember that first time because it was at the orlando airport we were all flying out of orlando to go i think that first day was in like denver or something like that. yeah we like had rehearsals there yeah for like a week or something like that at the a long the time venue. yeah <laughs> rehearsal and slash so, keep building the house yes yes keep building the house get good at building the house I remember walking up to the, the gate and seeing everyone kind of sitting there. And the only person I'd met at the time was the tour manager, uh, Matt, at the time. So I went up and just started talking to him. And then everyone kind of like dispersed around the gate and like took seats and stuff. And so I like, I just went over and sat down. I think it was next to Atkinson and Woodard. And yeah. I, I maybe remember Neil being in the section. I don't remember. There was like a, a good group of us like in a section. I sat down and it was like a couple of beats. And I'm like, I wouldn't describe myself as like a wallflower by any means. I feel like I'm pretty outgoing and I can like talk yeah. to people. But I do like to sit back and kind of observe my surroundings before I yeah. uh, interact with them. You're reading the room. Yeah, exactly. Important. So I was just kind of taking it in and kind of seeing what everyone's vibe was. And uh I remember, I can't remember who it was, but someone turned around and it was just like, hey, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> what, are you what are you doing here? Like, yeah. Why are you sitting with us? And I was like, like oh, management didn't tell them or anything. It's so weird how that works remember, out. I, I don't remember. I mean, I'm sure they were just like, they knew that they had someone running VIP, but they, they didn't know it was me or something. I don't yeah. know. And I explained it and they're like, oh, right. Okay. And then it just kind of went from there. Like, everyone in that you all of you guys were just instantly so cool and like just brought me in because you guys had all been touring together for a while at that point yeah yeah if not touring together just that run of shows for those like three or four years right there was just like constant 
yeah, it, uh, it just kind of went from there. Uh, after that tour was when my bosses told me that they, they liked me. Uh, the data remember guys told them how much they liked me and that they should hire me. And so they did. I got brought in like that right after that tour, like November 2013 or something like that is when I started getting a paycheck. And I've been here ever since. I just celebrated my ninth anniversary of working for the company the other Congratulations. Week. Yeah, it's pretty wild. I've never worked anywhere for nine years before. That'd be weird if before being the age of 18, you had worked somewhere for nine years. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> I've been here since I was in fifth grade. It's kind of a big deal. What I was going to say is like, okay, so you're working at this management company interning. When you were interning there, was your goal like, I want to become a manager? Or was your goal more like anything they have, I'm just trying to like do more, move up, move forward? It was more so that the second one, to be honest with you. I, in retrospect, looking back at my life up until this point, like it has been a lot of like flying by the seat of my pants, not really having that much of a plan and just being like, that sounds fun and I can make money at it. So I'm going to go do that. I always thought, um, you know, post uh, not becoming a famous, uh, you know, indie film director. Um, I, <laughs> I never I, knew that about you. I'm sorry I'm oh, laughing, yeah. but it's just, no, I no, love it's that. Hilarious. It's a, it, it, can you imagine if that would have happened, dude? I'm like living in Tribeca, still could. Wearing like a beret, and oh, it could, it could, like we could still make it happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, what a different dude would be sitting in this bed talking to you. <laughs> um, I lost my train of thought, though. What were we talking about? Uh, I kind of asked you like what your goal was, and you oh, were right. talking. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Not not really a goal. Post film school, it seemed like. I just kept getting pulled back towards music. So I was like, yeah, I'm, I'll just lean into that. I don't know who said it, but there's a quote that I've always liked where it's like, just find something that you like to do and then figure out how to make money at it. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good quote. Yeah, I, that's kind of what I ended up doing and just kind of figuring it out. I did touring because the touring was what, um, touring was what I knew. Yeah. So that is just what felt comfortable going back to immediately after leaving New York. And then it was just like being asked to do things and having to figure it out. And then that just becoming like, I never set out to be a VIP guy, but yeah. on a tour that I was selling merch for, they asked me like, Hey, we're doing these like upgraded VIP things for like a, few, a group of small fans. We need someone to run it. Can you do that? And I was just like, I guess. <laughs> It's kind of the same vibe as like your old jobs. It's like, just show up and do the thing. You all you right. got to do is do the thing. Show up, do the thing. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And then it just kind of like morphed. I kind of, when I was first starting at uh, like interning places and stuff like that, yeah. I kind of thought that I wanted to be an A&R guy at a label. For people who uh, I guess don't know, uh, artist and repertoire is what it stands for. Um, some people say it stands for artist and restaurant. I thought it was artists and relations. It's not. That's a, that is a common misconception. It is not. Hey, man. Relations. It's artist and repertoire. I have no ego. I'm down to be wrong, <laughs> even you know, a year into learning about the industry. Let's I, fact, go. I was in a meeting when I was an intern with an A&R guy. He asked me what I thought. The only reason I know that is because he, this A&R guy, when I was an intern, asked me what A&R stood for. And I said, artist in relations he goes no <laughs> <laughs> you're like i feel like i was set up right now this was yeah, not nice <laughs> i was absolutely set up for that but it is ingrained in my brain uh, i thought i wanted to do that they are the the people at labels who connect a lot of the dots um they work with like producers and mixers and like they work with the bands to like create music and like they are often the one you know people who are like signing bands and stuff like that. And I thought I wanted to do that, but through working with labels and management companies, both like as an intern working in yeah. the offices or as someone who is an employee of a client, like working for them, I kind of slowly saw like you could really do a lot of cool things and work on more cool things if you're a manager. And it wasn't an intentional thing. It's just, through the path as it started i started leaning more towards that and like the road was going that way is i i kind of that dawned on me and i was like oh this seems way more fun and way cooler like the number of things that i've gotten to do just working for 
as a manager is like wild yeah. just just for a day to remember like you know we got to do we did like i forget what tour it was i think it was the parks and devastation tour we did like a, a series of like really cool screen printed posters that were done by like different artists and stuff like that and you got to work with all the artists that was so cool and we got we ended up getting to do one with the guy who did the album artwork for the mark tom and travis show the live blink 82 album which is like i mean i have i have a blink 82 tattoo yeah. that i have with neil from, <laughs> and like that kind of stuff a, a really big like full circle moment are like it, it's so crazy sometimes like i remember going again with a day a lot of them have been with a day to remember being with a day to remember on a video shoot and this the guy that was directing it his name's shane drake he's like especially when we were younger like i mean he's directed a bunch of paramore videos yeah. and the rocket summer and panic at the, he directed the panic at the disco video the like d1 of him in like the carnival outfit but yeah the, the I OG. In song. yeah i worshiped the dude and he was directing this video so i got to like the end of me video. around yes if you want to look it up to, yeah it's a great video and he remembered me because when I was in high school and going to film school, I would like a dork email him because I got his email <laughs> off his website. I would email him questions like, dude, you did this really cool like technique in this video. How'd you do that? And he would respond. And I, I mean, never in a million years, it would only happen like maybe two or three times, but like, yeah, you know, over 10 years later, I'm on a video set and like introduced myself to the dude. And he was legit like, Oh my God, you used to email me questions back in the day. And I was like, <laughs> this is bonkers. You remember me? Like yeah. you're, you're the guy. It, it, like getting to do that kind of stuff and have those moments where like my life comes full circle has been like the absolute most rewarding part of being a manager. Because like, if I wasn't working as a manager, or in a, a, like a management kind of company structure, you know, doing something for a lot of different types of bands. I would never get to work on stuff like that or meet those yeah. kinds of people. Like it's the best part. And I love how through everything you do, it's very evident that you're just a huge fan of music. And, you know, I've seen you, I've seen you side stage for the one years and I know what excited <laughs> Bing looks like. I was wondering if you were going to bring that up. You guys gave me, so much crap on that tour. Who did? Being, oh, the, well, the other uh, like a day to remember crew guys, not because oh, gotcha. I, it was the Wonder Years or anything like that, because like you know that's just that's not really. I, I feel like it's a pretty unique thing. Like I am a huge fan of music, and I mean even the bands that I work with now. Like if I'm at a show, I'm screaming and like having a good time, and like <laughs> you could put you in the audience and you blend right in. Actually, you would stand yeah. out. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, in a good way. I, I think that that's a that is a rare thing for people who work in music, who go to concerts sometimes on a daily basis. Like it's yeah. easy to get jaded and just be like, and I'm guilty of that sometimes too. Just being like, cool, we're at a, we're at a show. Yeah, you're working. Yeah, it's the moments where it gets you, or like just like the breakdown hits in a certain way or like the the intro is like so cool or punch the person like next like, to you it just it just grabs me man still yeah. it's like it is still my favorite my favorite part of the whole thing is going to shows and that like did the first show back after all of this it was like pretty emotional what'd you see who was it it was i went to go uh see wage wage okay. tour. Um, they had a tour that went out last fall, Beartooth, um, and that was my first show back. I think it was like 500 something days in between shows, which is like crazy for me. Like I've, you know, been going on and on this whole time, uh, but like I've been going to shows since I was 15. Like yeah. I, there hasn't been like a month without a show for me. And I don't even since then until, you know, the world ended. Uh, so that first show back was just like, I can't believe how much I missed being in a room with 2000 sweaty, screaming people. Like if you would ask me the day before, like how excited are you? I'd have been like, yeah, I'm excited to like that. We're getting our lives back and stuff. But in the, the next day at that show being there, it was, it's just like, Oh, this is what it's about. You probably felt alive again, alive for oh the first God, time in a long time. It, it was like, it was so energizing. It was yeah, that's great. I mean, yeah, I mean, I like how much of a fan you are because I think it comes through as like, you know, some people might not be that way in 
at a concert setting, you know, there might be a manager and they're just sitting there and they, I feel like even if they're not showing it, they feel that way inside. Otherwise they wouldn't yeah. be where they are. And I like that you show it because it, it's how honest you are. <clears throat> I think I've gotten some weird looks sometimes. He's in charge of this artist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He does what? <laughs> yeah. But you know, I think that's an endearing quality of myself and you know, I, whatever, I like it. I'm having a no, good time. No, I like so. it too. <laughs> yeah. I like it because, um, I mean, I like how much of a fan you are because I feel like that's why everybody does this in the first place. And if there's one thing that I would love for listeners to get from this podcast is that if you like music, there is an avenue for you in this industry, even if playing music isn't it. So many. Like, you could you could go to college for something so not music related and end up being in the music. I mean, you do everything, business affairs, accountants, lawyers, like you can, they're, the music industry is so vast and so wide, but also such a small community that like it, there are jobs at labels and at companies that do anything in music that are so specific and strange where you're like, that's a gig. That's not, I guess someone has to do that, I guess. So like, yeah. yeah, that's a job. <laughs> Like you can get it, you can get your foot in the door a lot of different ways. And the way that you get your foot in the door doesn't necessarily have to be right out of the gate. The thing that you do, you know? Yeah. Like when you were doing VIP at mm -hmm. Fly South, did you kind of make it known to them that your end goal was management or no, so how did you all. transfer from interning or working more of like day job esque? jobs under their umbrella into being is partner the right word i mean you're, you're a manager there now you know you, I'm a you manager, do yeah. yeah yeah so like and it happened so from the outside looking in seamlessly like like there was a point there where i was like wait you're a manager now yeah you yeah. know it's like it's pretty cool yeah jordan who used to sell merch for a day yeah, we found him on here he, yeah jordan's great he used to he used to give me some crap because my my email used to be intern two at fly south music so like, that was an email address <laughs> oh yeah i wasn't even the first intern i was the, i was intern two intern t-o-o -O. yeah yeah also <laughs> i lost my train of thought again what were we talking about uh, i was talking about like how you went from kind of like day job esque at oh, right. management to yeah so i was i was an intern which is like doing a lot of the the grunt work stuff, yeah, yeah, busy work stuff, filling out spreadsheets or like, you know, uh, at the time I was doing, like I was posting a lot on Facebook for like targeted ad mats for like cities. Okay. Like if we had a band that was on tour, like I would go in and make posts, individualized posts for each city that were targeted only for like the region around that city yeah, and stuff like that. And then when I got brought on, as an actual employee and getting mm -hmm. paid, it was still doing a lot of that kind of stuff because they were like figuring out what they wanted to do with me. They just, they just, they knew that they liked me and I was a hard worker and I got along well with bands. I knew how to talk to bands um, because I toured for so yeah. long. I, I can relate to, to them. I have a long touring history that can like be very relatable to them. I know what it's like to do 18 shows in a row. You know, on every area of their yeah. job. Right. So they were trying to figure out what, how they wanted to incorporate me into their structure. Um, and then I was, I was an assistant for, I don't even know how long, like a while, not maybe not quite a year. I'm not sure, but I was an assistant, which is I, an amazing way for anyone listening to get your foot in the door, look for assistant jobs because you're basically a paid intern. Kind of. Yeah. That's basically what an assistant is. It's like, you know, uh, it depends on the situation. You know, a lot of assistants have a lot of responsibility, not quite intern. So I'll walk that back a little bit. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I, that is where I learned a lot about like what managers do and the kinds of conversations that they have to have and like the people that they deal with at labels and agencies and that kind of stuff. Being an assistant and being right there. And what I enjoyed a lot about it was it got me in the room or it got me on the phone call. So, you know, I'm muted. I'm not listening or talking, or I'm not talking or, 
you know, chiming in because that's not my place. Yeah. But being able to listen, you know, I was saying before, like I do kind of, I'm not a wallflower, but I do like to read the room and kind of understand my surroundings and stuff and listening and hearing how people interact in certain situations and stuff like that. Like being an assistant really gave you a crash course. Going to school, kind of. You're getting trained they, 100%. passively that, almost. That, that is what it was. It's a passive training. You have to be aware of it and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. You know, I think a big part of that, a lot of the people that become successful and work their ways up are people who do know how to do that. Like keep your mouth shut, read the room, and understand when is the place to speak up. I mean, when you get asked, for sure, for your opinion, yes. make sure that you... <laughs> you give it and you know, you give it with conviction and stuff like that. But you know, I've been told multiple times throughout my career from a myriad of people in different positions in the industry that that was a quality that they liked in me that I know, I know how to be in the room and not, not be a distraction or not let the person who needs to lead the meeting, lead the meeting instead of, you know, a very wide range of different uh, experiences. But you, you learn that being, Working that closely with someone every single day and being on all of their calls and all of their meetings and stuff like that, you you get the crash course pretty quick. And it's, you know, and I've experienced this, you know, attribute of yours because I was touring and you entered that group and you came into a close knit group of people and kind of seamlessly and effortlessly assimilated, I guess, assimilated into the social group and it, you didn't come in hot or you didn't come. I mean, you, you were still yourself, but you know, you kind of found your way in. And I mean, really, we talk about that so much reading the room, you know, networking, just these social skills that are viable in the industry. At what point did you identify within yourself that, Hey, these skills that exist within me naturally, or that I am able to learn easily would make me a good manager And, you know, what did that, like, basically I want to paint a picture for somebody who maybe isn't a manager yet or doesn't know that they want to be one, what they might see in themselves that would put them in that path or that trajectory Mm -hmm. for a career. Is there, what, what stuck out to you about yourself? I mean, at the time when everything, when I was like first getting into it, I mean, I don't, I didn't know, you know, I, I, I'm a big believer in like uh, imposter syndrome is so real. Yeah. And it happens to literally everyone. If you think you're alone and feeling like you don't know what you're doing in your job or your hobby or what have you, like we're just making it up. Everyone is just trying to figure it out. So I don't, I didn't really recognize stuff back then. I mean, I think yeah. now it's the stuff that we've, we've been talking about. It's, it's knowing how to read the room. I, I, I just yeah. know like a better way to say it just like that has gotten me. I mean, I'll just got another a day to remember example just because. Yeah. I love the examples. Like I love the stories, like bring them out, dude. I'm ready. I remember specifically on the house party tour, the first tour I did with everyone, it was early on. And I, I actually, I have a lot, I have some close friends in common with the a day to remember guys, because we're all from Florida Okay. Um, so I, I knew like a little bit about like everyone's personalities and stuff like that. And I'm also, I was a pretty big fan as well. Like I remember skipping senior year of high school and going to get tacos with my buddy and he put on fast forward to 2012. Oh uh, like, yeah. What is this? What is We this? must be the same age. Uh, I'm 33. Yeah, I am too. 88. What's up? Well, I'm almost, well, actually I lied. I'm 32, but I turned 33 this year. Uh, yeah, I was in December, but it was like early on in the tour and you know, I didn't want to overstep my bounds. I was the new guy. Like I just wanted to go out there, do the gig, have a good time, come back and see what happens. Maybe I get to tour with the day to remember again. And I remember I was packing up the VIP area, which uh, on that tour, like included in, like an acoustic performance and a Q and A and stuff. And there was a PA and <clears throat> all that kind of stuff I had to set up. Um, so I was packing all that stuff down to go back into the truck at the end of the night. And like, you know, one of the other bands that was on the tour was playing and Neil walked into the like VIP area. I was like, Hey, what's <laughs> up, man? How you doing? Just packing up, like listening to music and stuff. And we like started talking like kind of very surface, you know, level, like, how's the day? Like blah, blah, blah. And then I remember like there was a pause and he looked at me and he goes, you know that we like you, right? Like you can come and hang out with us. 
<laughs> and I was like, okay, yeah, awesome. And like, I, I feel like my uh, reading the room and kind of staying in the back and kind of observing stuff can be a little bit of a detriment sometimes, you know, in that situation. Like I was, I was kind of staying away because I didn't know anybody really. I, I wasn't like, the people I was the closest with on that tour were not in the band or crew that I was working with. Like I knew all the wonder years guys because we had done warp tour with each other a couple of times. A good friend of mine worked in their crew and stuff like that. Like, yeah. So I was like going to hang out with like the other bands a little bit more than I was with them, but it's because, you know, I was still trying to like read the room and then I got the go ahead and, you know, it's the, it, it's those kinds of interactions that uh, I think, are the qualities that like make me a good manager, like being able to be, I'll say this. And I've said this a a few different times to a lot of people over the years. I think one of the biggest things in the industry, whether it's touring or in the business side, working at labels or agencies and stuff, be a good hang. That is the number one thing. Don't be a punisher. Don't be a jerk. Like just, just be a good hang, be a, a joyful, like enjoyable person to be around. And that will get you in the door more <laughs> than a lot of other stuff. Like I, a lot of the jobs that I got, especially like touring, wise, that industry is very word of mouth. So like, if you're trying to do that, being a good hang is, I think the number one biggest thing on tour. Like if you are not, if, if, if I got a call from someone saying like like if we're looking for uh, whatever a guitar tech or something like that it's like okay i found this guy he's got a great resume he's worked for big bands and stuff like that i call his references or if i call someone who knows him yeah i know that knows him or her or whatever what kind of like are they a good roommate like that's what that's what's unique about tour jobs and stuff right because like you not only have to be good at your job but you also have to be a good roommate because you're living in a turtle shell with 11 other people like you have to be a good hang it is an absolute requirement of yeah. the industry job <laughs> it's crazy but it and is and if you can't be a good hang just get a camera i'm just kidding oh stop it <laughs> <laughs> you're one of the best hang. no you're i'm just of- i'm just giving a hard time <laughs> <laughs> to, to just, I'm just saying, like photographers are a different breed. Get a camera and shut up and sit in the corner. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> hanging is definitely, you know, everybody hangs differently, and yeah, I think that what a good hang looks like depends on your job, your personality. It's not saying be the same as everybody else. It's just saying, no. I think people just recognize, like, just be real, be you. And sometimes yeah. it meshes with people. Sometimes that doesn't. And if it doesn't, it doesn't always mean you're a bad hang. It just means it's not a good fit. Find another band find another artist i mean i've i've worked you know in the touring side worked with bands who it was you know we just we didn't vibrate on the same wavelength you know yeah like we you know there's just those people out there you know what i mean sometimes you're like you said it's just not a good fit yeah yeah no that makes sense it'd be and it'd be so funny like i was just thinking of somebody who didn't read the rumor was not new was new to the music industry your statement would have sounded more like yeah and there's people i didn't vibe with they are and you would have just started listing it (laughs) and you'd be like wait a second you're doing it wrong yeah absolutely i mean yeah that's a great example yeah (laughs) yeah don't do that (laughs) oh man no i love hearing i love hearing the stories that stick out to people like you and talking about Neil and people who have listened to this podcast are familiar with Neil and his personality. And I can picture him saying that to you in his words and his tone. Yeah. Yeah. He's done a lot for me, not just like, you know, helping me get my foot in the door with places, but he is, uh, he gasses people up. Like he's, he's an amazing human being who just like, yes, cares about people. It's great. I were, I mean, you know, I'll just tell another story. You know, the pandemic obviously was like very hard for people all over the world in every industry. Uh, I think, you know, maybe I'm a little bit biased, but the music industry was hit one of the hardest, especially the touring industry. You know, touring and like touring and like, and Broadway and like, you know, at the beginning, like a lot of like filmed entertainment stuff was the only thing that was like, boom, done. There's yeah, non-essential things that exist for entertainment just kind of just drop. Absolutely, absolutely gone. You know, so and that was hard for a lot of people and, and stuff like that. I was very lucky in that I knew, you know, people locally where I lived who I could like, you know, pick up 
some shifts on the weekends and like that to like make a little extra side money when things were tight. And Neil was one of those people. I mean, I worked at Winter Park Biscuit Company for a, a number of months during the pandemic. Just that's and sick. It was great. I didn't I know that. Think, Damn, I would have gone just oh, for yeah. you. Oh yeah, yeah. It, that is it was, cool. It was so fun because I just got to work with my friends. Like Neil was there most of the time that I was working and stuff. So it was like it didn't really feel like work even though I was like, you know, packing up chicken sandwiches, <laughs> vegan chicken sandwiches. They're not real chicken, guys. It's yeah, vegan food. Vegan. Yes. In fact, we we were told, uh, I'm pretty sure we're, you're, we're, we were supposed to say plant-based because vegan can be confusing to some people. They don't, they don't really understand. Hey, it's that's all fair. plant-based. Now plant-based. you know. We're plant-based, plant-based and artist and repertoire. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I just, I'm also giving uh, grammar and vocabulary lessons. Yes. That was called a callback. I say that now because I've heard it in so many things where people say that's a callback and now I just say it as a call. Yeah, just say it as like, I don't know even how to explain what I'm doing. It's probably less funny if I explain it or more ridiculous. Made me laugh. I like it. Yeah. Hey, man. If you're not watching the video, I would encourage you to because Bing has... You have a con- you remind me of my best friend Craig, who also listens to podcasts. What up, Craig? Everything's more fun if you can find yourself somebody like Bing or Craig to watch movies with. Everything's mm. funnier and more memorable because you guys have those like laughs that are contagious, borderline yeah. offensive, and just so good. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're doing it now. It's a good laugh. I don't really mean they're offensive. offensive. I was just trying to get a laugh. I was just trying to get a laugh out of you. Uh, That was good. (laughs) Offensive (laughs) is very funny. Offensive laugh. Uh, I appreciate that. I, I, I mean, I think that's part of being a good hang, right? You know, it's like (laughs) good bring. You brought it back around, man. Just being, uh, you know, being a. Again, you you said it. uh, You know, after I said what I said about being a good hang, etc. But you know, it's like. It's not about conforming and just being like, uh, like, like everyone else and like yeah. just going with, but it's about like going with the flow and just being real. Like, I can't imagine trying to like stifle myself to be in yeah. a situation and stuff like that. Like, like you said, like sometimes situations, you're just not in the right situation. You're not with people that are on your wavelength. Sometimes it, you can, yeah, sometimes that happens. Sometimes you can transition people over you know, into being on your team. But, uh, but yeah, just being yourself, I think is, is the most important thing that you can do because people know when you're not being real, when you're trying to put a mask on and stuff. So what's, what does being yourself look like in this day and age for you? And I don't mean that in like a personal level, I mean it professionally, like you're a manager now, do you mind listing or sharing with us who you manage? And then in addition to that, kind of what your day-to-day life is like, like what, like, I, I know you made the joke artists and restaurants and that's because, you know, I'm sure your life is a lot of meeting up with, and that's A&R, but I'm sure your life is a lot of restaurants with bands and a lot of shows, but can you just explain what your job's like? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I work, I work for Fly South Music Group. I manage uh, Wage War, Magnolia Park, World's First Cinema uh, are like my big ones. And then I help out with like a lot of the other clients that we have uh, just kind of on like smaller basis and stuff like that you know i work yeah. with the ghost inside and and you know the other clients that we have i, I work with you guys will help out to the fly south music group but you have right, your own yeah, things we, you're kind of in charge of right right exactly i have like the things that i'm like steering the ship kind of on and then there's the stuff that i kind of do more day-to-day help out kind of stuff with on a daily basis i mean i one of my favorite things about what i do is that it's never the same there are always a lot of phone calls and emails and text messages and like conversations to have and stuff, but they're always about different stuff. Like it's never about, it's never about the same thing two days in a row, unless something like bad is going on. And it's like a continuing issue that we have to talk about, but like, like a tour is getting canceled because of a pandemic and you have to reschedule it. (laughs) Yeah. That's a good example. You know, like yesterday I was on the phone with an agent talking about, you know, routing and planning a tour, but I also had a meeting about like working with a nonprofit, like uh, that works with like mental health and stuff. And then I had uh, a couple conversations about like artwork that we were working on for a tour poster and the VIP laminates. And I had a conversation with radio people about doing like an acoustic event. Like it's just all so different. It ranges so far. Like, yeah, you could be having like, you know, 
a conversation with a lawyer about, you know, the fine print in a deal. And then the next minute you're having like, you know, a crazy conversation about like, what if we added more trash cans being thrown into the audience <laughs> on, in the artwork? Like, it's just like wild. <laughs> you're like, this is my, this is why. Yeah, that does sound, it's very yeah. vast. Have you ever contemplated wearing a suit to a show that you show up for like wage war, <laughs> just wearing a suit? Just like, uh, I feel I like feel that like would I'm really mess with them. The Mighty Mighty Boss Tones or something, like just going to a ska show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh is that Bing skanking right now? You're like, yes, that is him. Oh, I are you a good skanker? Oh, dude, flashback to like 15, 16 year old me, you would find me in the circle pit skanking oh, up a storm yes. to like less than Jake. And there was a there was a local ska band in Florida called the Spit Valves that I was like a huge fan of. Mine was I voted for Kodos. I just want to share that. <laughs> <laughs> that was our local ska is, band. I have Never heard of that, but that is an amazing, any band that takes their name from the Simpsons, automatically. I love that you got it right away, head. too. Of course. <laughs> Kang and Kodos, bro. <laughs> Man, what was the name of your local one? Because I kind of got so excited you were sharing it, I sh shared over you. The Spit Valves. That's pretty wild, too. The Spit Valves. Yeah, Man, wild, Scott needs to come back, name. I think. <laughs> well, the Mighty Mighty Boss Tones just broke up, so I don't know if that's an indication of ska actually being dead this time but maybe we'll get a sixth wave oh man well yeah dude i enjoy i like talking to you because i feel like we grew up although we grew up in different states we grew up in similar worlds you know we grew up far away distance wise but really close i mean literally otherwise. couldn't be farther away right you know i grew up in florida you're you're from san diego right no i am from wisconsin oh, oh what i didn't know isn't that, that weird <laughs> <laughs> but I, I am. Were, I thought you were a San Diegan. I mean, when we met, I lived in San Diego. I moved there when I was nineteen, so you know, oh, wow. I moved. So I, I I was in San Diego for ten years, so that or eleven ish years now. That counts for you to be able to change. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> I'm from San title. Diego. It's weird though, man. It's weird saying you're from somewhere. I, I still identify really heavily. Actually, when you said you worked for Between the Trees, I specifically remember. Did they tour with Barcelona? Or no. Mm. I don't remember. Okay. Well, I they toured so much with so many. I mean, like Amberlin and the Rocket Summer and uh, the Dangerous Summer and like just so many bands. Uh, I remember them playing in Madison. So I like looked it up, try to find it. Oh, yeah. And I'm, like, we played Madison my, a lot. Yeah, dude. At the Majest. I remember it. I remember seeing it on the flyer and everything and emailing to try to do a photo pass for the show, but I never got it. But. <laughs> I should have hit you up. That's where I messed up. You should have. Oh man. I'm like looking, I'm like looking through my emails to see if I like wrote the email at some point. That's so funny. I love, sometimes I love going back and looking up like, oh man, I did. I talked to this person when I was like 15 and asked them like a really lame question. <laughs> like the video guy. Like, Do you save all your emails? I try to, at least the ones that I know that are like important. You know what I mean? Like Google has like a limit. So like you can reach you're in your all of your uh, entire email being too full, which has happened to me a couple of times. Oh, you just yeah, I'm sure with a manner you probably meet reach my minute limit every year. I in fact I just did my yearly cleaning where I like get rid of a lot of the emails in my folders that are like two years old that aren't something that I need to keep or hold on to. It's like a flight for someone that I booked two years ago. Like <laughs> I can get rid of that. That's what you piece. think. I don't <laughs> yeah, right. It comes back around. It always does. What's your email count? Uh let's do monthly. What do you think your email count is monthly? I honestly don't I have no idea. Definitely hundreds, in the thousands. Hundreds. I think hundreds would be like a conservative uh, estimate. I don't, thousands seems like pretty high, but I, maybe. I guess it, dep it depends. It depends on the on the on what's going on. Like you know, yeah. uh, the end of the end of last year to now. Like I don't know, maybe hundreds, maybe thousands. But I I feel like I've been doing a lot of emails. But like you know, when things were not going on, like uh, not no not, not a dud. I can't imagine working in this industry before emails. Can you? It's just like crazy to me. I think about it all the time. I mean, I, I started touring so early that I still remember when we had to print out 
map quest, map quest. direction. I remember that he too. He had a, a three ring binder that felt like it was the size of like an encyclopedia printed out the whole tour printed out map quest directions so we could just rip them out when what? we were done and we could just keep going uh, i have an early tour story i want to sh- sorry keep going i, I was going to ask yeah. you i want to hear more early tour tour stories keep going i remember when i remember i was with between the trees and i remember the day we decided to go to best buy and buy like a garmin gps like it was like a new thing to have like a GPS thing that you could put in your car and like you didn't need yeah. to print out directions. You had to plug it in. Have a map. Like I remember having maps. We used to have to sit. If you were sitting in the front seat with the driver of the van, <laughs> you had the map. You're a map Which is why I never want like sitting in the in the front was like good because you could be comfortable and you weren't around like eight other people in the back of the yes. van. But you had to be in charge of the map and that stressed me out. And I did not yes. want that responsibility. Oh man. At 15. <laughs> Do you have any other like early touring story stories, I guess you'd say, that are like, I don't know, anything that you're like touring back then was a lot different. Oh my gosh, so different. I think what's fun about what was touring back then was like, A, there was like weird obstacles like that, like having to have a binder of directions printed out from Ask Jeeves or whatever, MapQuest. Google Maps didn't even exist at the time. I don't know, so many things about back then, dude. Like, I remember on, it was Warp Tour 2007, and we had an off day in Pomona, and I waited in line at the AT&T store to get the first iPhone. Like, I remember I was, like, <laughs> the popular, the new popular girl at high school the next day at Warp Tour because everyone found out that I bought the iPhone the day before, and they were all like, can I see it? Like, oh, my gosh, look at that you thing. You could touch like, it? You could touch the screen? Yeah. Yeah, dude. It doesn't it seem so like that long fun. ago. It was. It does not, but it was quite a long time ago. Over a decade. Get a sidekick. Almost two decades ago. Uh, um, yeah. Is it two? Crazy. Came out in 2000, what? Six? Seven. Seven, yeah, I was like a senior in high school. Yeah. While you're saying old touring stories, I was thinking like back when I was in a van, one of the funniest things to me was I had this battery for my flash that would power it. It had a power outlet in it that you could plug in, you know, whatever. And having tr- portable power was a was, was a thing back then. It was a big lithium battery. And before my photo shoots, I, at the time I was touring with Four Letter Lie, which is Kevin's old band from A Day to Remember, uh, the singer would always plug his hair straightener into my battery before our photo shoots to chart to, to straighten his hair when we'd, we'd hop out of the van and do a photo shoot. And I'm going to send you this video to watch after. I hope it shows up actually. Oh yeah, I'm going to have to send it to you. But it's really funny. Amazing. Hair straighteners were a big part of touring back then. (laughs) Oh my God. Yeah, that's wild. All right. Well, I mean, do you have, I think that, I mean, I like ending on those, uh, those stories. It's nice knowing where you came from, what you did, what you're doing now, because up until then, my fondest memories with you are like, I'm like, oh yeah, Bing, he did VIP. We hung out a bunch. We played Frisbee. Oh dude, that was, I remember that. Dude, oh, that was such a big part of our touring life for so long. What was your Frisbee was like, name? Fun, oh man, I think it was just Frisbing. I <laughs> <laughs> Frisbing. Frisbing, I think that sounds right. Frisbing, I'm pretty sure that's what it was. Dude, I rem- oh yeah. Remember that's a good we name. Used to, like, Remember when we were in North Carolina that one time and we like at just the hotel went out and de- yeah, we just went out downtown. We were just throwing Frisbees throughout downtown, like uh, somewhere in North Carolina. It was so weird. Yeah, we I got do that. All that was time. fun. We would get to a hotel, all change into like athletic, like shorts and shirts and like go out to play Frisbee in a city, like urban Frisbee. We got good. We, we got good at playing Frisbee. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I sucked at Frisbee before then. And it was like yeah. one of the first times in my life where I was like, oh, yeah, you can learn things, Adam. It's not you're not just a stagnant like vessel like <laughs> you can acquire more abilities in life. And Frisbee is one of them. Oh, man. Well, yeah, that was good times. I hopefully will see. I know I know you're in L.A. right now. When are you here till Saturday? Yeah, I leave on Saturday. All right, I'll text you after this to see if our schedules work out and maybe we can grab a meal or a coffee or something. It's, it's kind of wild. We're not far from each other right now. <laughs> I know, so that's pretty random, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, man, just let me know. Okay, cool. Well, thanks for coming on the podcast. I appreciate your time. Yeah, thanks for having me. And uh, last question before you go is actually, did you wear sh- shower shoes or not on tour? What's your vibe? It depends on the tour and what kinds of venues that you're touring in, in my opinion. Warp yeah, that's tour, a safe way to do it. Warp Tour, absolutely wear shower shoes. There are hundreds of people. Well, I mean, Warp Tour is not a thing anymore, but 
it's like you're at summer camp. You know what I mean? There's yeah. hundreds of people using those showers. Mm-mm. Showers. Not half an in. But if you're at like House of Blues, if you're at like a House of Blues and your green room has a shower, like, I mean, you know, I feel like that's okay. Yeah, yeah. That's like a, a home shower. Bad. It's not like a public but shower. Definitely don't poop on the bus. <laughs> No pooping on the bus. Well, thank you so much, Bing. I will catch you around. I appreciate your time here. And with that being said, take it away, Kevin. Kevin.